Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you and to welcome you to our service today. As you will have seen, the um, announcement sequence is not a lot going on. Uh, we've got that time of year when things are a little bit slacker as far as uh, organisations are concerned. But just to remind the Kirk Session and the committee of their meetings on Thursday evening. Uh, and then, um, you may have already received on your way in, but the, the next quarter for the Word for Today uh, Bible notes are available. Um, they begin at the beginning of May, so um, if you haven't got your copy, please collect it on your way out. And if you want to take it to someone else, please do so. Let's worship God together. Psalm 32, we read, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. I acknowledge my sin to you. I will not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is the... God who loves us and who forgives us when we come to him in humility and contrition. So let's join together and praise him for who he is as we stand to sing Praise is Rising. Come to God in prayer. Let us pray. It's right and fitting, O oh God, that our praise rises to you because of who you are. 
We come before you, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, the God who does not change, the God who is merciful, and yet the God who is holy in every way. And we thank you and we praise you that we can come as sinful people before a holy God and worship. And that's all possible because of Jesus Christ, your only begotten son. And so as we meet here today, we, we do so in the precious name of Jesus. He who has opened up the way for us to return to God. To be in your presence day and daily. To recognize when we come before you that we need to confess. And as we were reminded in the scriptures that when we confess our transgressions, then we can be forgiven. We thank you that Jesus Christ does that for us because he took the punishment that we deserve and on the cross of Calvary, he bore the burden of our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, because you make our lives new. You change us from people who are in rebellion to God into friends of God and servants of God. And we serve willingly because of what we owe you, O oh God. We're not trying to repay you for what you've done, but it's out of love and out of respect and out of that wonderful thanksgiving from the depths of our hearts we say lord you've loved us and so we love you back and in loving you we do that by what we do and say in your name so we pray <clears throat> this afternoon that <clears throat> we will leave this place refreshed in faith that we will want to serve you god that we will want to acknowledge you to be lord of our lives and that we will go into a new week knowing your presence, knowing that our sins have been wiped away. We go afresh to a world that needs to hear you, to need, needs to know about you and to hear of your love. And they can do that through us. So may this time of worship that we have together be a preparation time for being witnesses for you in this world so accept the worship we bring whether it be in song in prayer or meditation upon your word may everything we do honor you O god so that may the spirit come and instruct us inspire us and enthuse us so that jesus christ will receive all the glory Hear our prayer, for we come in the precious name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, and so we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, boys and girls, would you like to join me at the front? Now, I want you to tell me a few things this morning, and then I'm going to show you something which is absolutely amazing. Now, hello, James. Now, um, I've got here just a blank page, okay, and I've got a pen. So I want you to tell me, or maybe, and this is, this is, 
maybe mummy and daddy don't know about this, so we we'll ask them to be, to be to close their ears. But I want you to tell me of some of the bad things you did this week. Oh, oh no, oh, no, no, oh. <laughs> Chloe, do, no, don't you don't you look at Ruby because I'm sh I'm sure Ruby did bad things too. Anyway. <laughs> What sort of things did you do that mm, mm, weren't very nice? This is confession time, they call it. This is time whenever you, you'd say, well, I actually didn't do. Well, what did you do wrong? Well, I'll give you a few suggestions. Did you tell a lie? Oh, aren't you wonderful? Well, did you hurt anybody or anything? <laughs> Were you really angry with somebody? <laughs> They're laughing. I wonder, do they believe that you actually did some of these things? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to... Right, I, I was angry during the week. Okay. Okay, I was angry during the week. What else could we have done? You didn't say any bad words, did you? No? Should I ask? Should, should I ask mums and dads or nan and granda? Or, oh, 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 here now. There's a wee bit of conspiracy going on here. <clears throat> I'm not telling you if you don't tell me. Okay. Anything else? No? You must be wonderful children. Well, let's put it another way. Did mommy and daddy have to be cross with you? No. Was nanny or granda cross with you? Yes, okay. So you must have done something that was really right. Okay. Well, you see, Sometimes when we don't do things or we say things, we might think things. Mm. So maybe we'll put down thoughts. Now let's see if I can spell thoughts. Never was great at spelling. But anyway. Okay. Anything else? What else could we think of? Did, did you hit anybody? No. You didn't. Oh, manners. Oh, here. That's very good. Your manners weren't good. Thank you for confessing that. Okay. Manners. So it was actually bad manners. That right. Okay. So we've got angry. We've got thoughts. We've bad manners. Is there anything else you can think of? Maybe we should ask the, 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 the mums and dads, the, the, the older folk, did they do anything wrong this week? Oh, yes. <laughs> now, was that for the, from the older person saying that, or was that the younger person? Did we get annoyed because they didn't do what we wanted them to do? Or they wouldn't give us something that we really wanted? Yes, well, I definitely got, got annoyed. Okay, I'm a very sinful person. Okay, things that we do... And whenever you add all those up, there is one word in the Bible that tells us what they are. What is that? Sins. sins. And the Bible says that sins are not what God wants us to do. I'm going to show you something which I think is wonderful. Okay. I brought it here with me. Have you any idea what it does? No? Well, I'm going to take... All these things, but you're so wonderful, of course. All these things that you say that you might have done. And I'm going to print, set it there, and I'm going to press a button. Where did it go? In there. In there. And what do you think happened to it? In there. You don't know? What do you see? What does it do? Put it into lines. Put it into lines, yes. It, it shoot it up. 
and you can't put them back together again. So I think we should maybe take this one as well. James, would you like to put it under the machine? Okay, you just put it further down in there, and I'll press the button. Sorry. Oh, you press the button that way there. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Did the same thing happen? <gasps> yeah, it happened. Great. Well, I'm going to tell you about this wonderful machine. It's called a shredder and things that you want to get rid of, and so that no one can ever put them back together again, <clears throat> put in the machine, and that machine chews it up, and that's it, gone. The Bible tells us whenever we do wrong things, that if we come and we tell God about those things, he will then take those things that we've done, and he'll shred them. He'll forget all about them, and we're forgiven, and the Bible says well, whenever we talk to God and say, sorry, that's what happens. And the other, other people might say, oh, you did this and you did that and you did that in the past. And um, the, the Bible says whenever God forgives us, he forgets about it. It's gone. And he gives us the opportunity to start anew and to do things the way we should do it. So what do you call that thing? Shredder. Shredder. And what does it do? It shreds things up, yes. It's like, tearing, it's like tearing them, only it puts them into wee tiny bits. And you could never take that out and put them together again. And God says, when we ask him to forgive us, he will do that for our sin. We're going to sing a song that says, God is so good, he's so good to me. And the second verse is, he took my sin. And then the third verse says, I'm free. I'm free because God has forgiven us. You know that one? Good. Well, we're going to sing it. Thank you. Let's stand to sing. we come now to our prayers for others and uh, Shauna has recorded that for us. Father God, we come to you as a precious child of yours, your beloved daughter. Father God, we come to you as a precious child of yours, your beloved one who is worthy of all our praise. We thank you that we can meet together to look and worship you without fear thank you that we can use your word to help us and hear your voice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Father God, we come to you as a precious child of yours, our King Jesus, as your beloved Son. You're the Creator, you're the Holy One who is worthy of all our praise. We thank you that we can meet together to look and worship you without fear. Father God, in this world in which we live, we do proclaim and we 
acknowledge and we believe that you are in control of all things. And yet, when we look around us, we are dismayed because of what is happening. We think of the threats that are continuing to come from other countries, those who are trying to take over other countries, intimidate them, threaten them, and bringing hardships upon the people who live there. And so, Lord, we continue to think of what is happening in Ukraine, even though it's not on our news bulletin so often, because of the things that are happening in Gaza, in Israel, the threats from Iran. Lord, we realize that this is the work of evil people. And so we ask, O oh God, that in your love and in your mercy, that you will stay the hands of those who are doing such things. We pray, O oh God, for world economies because we recognize what happens in one country can affect the rest of the world. And we pray, O oh God, for those governments who are struggling to make ends meet within their own countries. And then, oh God, we recognize that other countries who come to their aid sometimes have ulterior motives to do so. Lord, this is all because of sin. This is all because of greed. Grasping for power. And so we pray for peace. We pray for reconciliation. We pray for economic stability. And most of all, O oh God, we pray that your name will be heard and respected throughout the world. We think of what is happening in the presidential elections over in America, and we realize how powerful that country is and how what happens there indeed does affect the rest of the world. And all the discussions and all the plans and all, all the rallies that they have. We pray, O oh God, that there will be truth, there will be honesty, there will be the desire to lead the country in the right ways. Father, we pray for our own land, we pray for our own government, we pray for our own ex executive, we pray for the MLAs here at home, in the midst of all that is happening and the turmoil, the uncertainty, we pray, O oh God, that there will be a seeking the Lord's face. We've got away from that, O oh God. We do our own thing. And then we wonder why things are in a mess. We ignore your word to our detriment. And so we pray, Lord, for the, the church, the church here in our own land, whatever the de denomination, we pray that there will be a seeking the Lord's will. There will be a desire to follow your word. Lord, we think of the pressures in, in which some of the people in our own land are experiencing, those who work for the health service, as we hear that things are under so much pressure they could crash at any time. We thank, O oh God, of the staff who are living under that pressure and going into their work each day and wondering what they're going to face and how they're going to resolve the issue and then going home in the evening, realize, yes, they have done a good work, but it's not enough. To Lord, we pray for our MLAs as they discuss these problems, that they will make the right decision, that they will get the priorities right. We pray for those who need the health service at this, at this time in their lives. We, we thank you for the skills and the knowledge that have been given to the medical teams. We pray that they will be able to bring relief from illness. They will bring peace to mind, healing to the body. 
We pray for those who are suffering at this time, those who are on long waiting lists and their condition is getting worse. Lord, we, we pray for them that they will know your presence and that you will come and give them contentment of mind, knowing that if they entrust themselves into your hands, they are secure. For those who are bereaved today, O oh God, for various reasons, whether it through accident, long-term illness, we pray, Lord, that you will draw near to them, that in their sorrow they will know your comfort. And oh God, oh God, we continue to pray for our farmers. We thank you for the respite from the, the rain this last couple of days but Lord we, we realize that we need more heat in the ground we need it, the ground to dry up a bit so that the crops can be can be sown that the animals can get out into the fields we pray Lord that you will hear us as we ask for this we do not control the weather you're in control of all things and so we come to you the one who can do all things. For our own church family here, O oh God, we ask your continued blessing. We ask that you will surround us with your love. You will guide us in the days that lie ahead. We will be faithful witnesses to the goodness of God, the grace of God, and that we will be able to make an impact on our community here, that they will see that we love the Lord and we love his work. So, Lord, in the silence, we bring to you our own personal desires, wishes, and prayers. For our good and for the sake and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask these things through his name. Amen. We're reminded in our next song that we do have someone who hears us and answers us um, as we sing before the throne of God.
as we come to God's word, let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you have given us the word of God, your son, who came and lived among us. But we thank you too for the written word that tells the story of creation, of redemption, and of your great, wonderful love for us and your plan for us. So as we come and we study your word together, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During the Second World War, servicemen, when they were writing home, particularly to their sweethearts, would have use acronyms. And here is a photograph of an envelope that was sent in 1943 back home from um, the battle in Europe. Uh, you may not be able to see very clearly, but underneath the flag there, there are four letters. And here's what they are. Have you any idea? what those letters mean. Sealed with a kiss. Yes, I know sometimes Valentine's Day in days of yore, don't think, I don't know whether they even send Valentine cards now, but uh, they, usually, they, they probably send a text or something. But uh, sometimes it would S-W-A-L-K, uh, sealed with a loving kiss. But to say on this particular envelope, it was sealed with a kiss. Today <clears throat> in our study in, in the book of Mark, we're going to see how the events that were coming up to the Good Friday were basically sealed with a kiss. And we're going to read from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 52, and um, Marilyn has recorded that for us. Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 52. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. Now the betrayer has arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Amen. 
Um, and we know that the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. And we thank Marilyn for recording that for us. In this passage, I want to leave with you three headings to help you remember this part of the story. Uh, this week, they all begin with the letter P to help us remember. The first thing I want you to think with me is the place. In this passage, we are told in the very beginning that they went to a place. This place, this is what it looks like today. Um, and some of those trees that are there have been there for over uh, 2,000 years. It is, of course, Gethsemane, which in the original language basically mean, means oil press. This was an olive grove. This was a place where they would have taken the olives and they crushed them to get the olive oil. And it's fitting, indeed it's ironic, that the actual story that's going to open up for us in this passage is talking about someone who was experiencing pressure, a lot of pressure, that being the Lord Jesus. This place, Gethsemane, was well known to the disciples because John's gospel tells us that Jesus often met there with his disciples. And that's why Judas would have known where to look for Jesus. If he had gone back to the upper room where they had met for the Passover meal and found it empty, he probably thought to himself, where would Jesus have gone? I know. He's gone to Gethsemane. This place was going to be a place of pressure. This place was well known to the disciples. Jesus took them there often to be quiet, to instruct them, and he would have gone there to pray. And that's why we read and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. This may have been something that was quite familiar to them, that Jesus would have taken time to pray and ask them to wait for him. Sit here while I pray. Prayer was so much part of the Lord's life. We read throughout the scriptures that Jesus would have taken himself off to be alone, to pray. Uh, the night of the storm on the Lake Galilee, Jesus had been on the mountain praying and then he looked out and he saw the disciples struggling as they were trying to cross the lake. But Jesus withdrew to pray. I think if we listen very carefully to that, if Jesus thought that prayer was important, well, should prayer not be important to us as well? But then we go on and we discover that he took Peter, James, and John, that, the three who were often with him, and we talked about that last week. He took them aside, and we read that he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Eight disciples were further over in the garden. He told them to sit while he went to pray. He brings the three with him. He asked them to stay where they were while he went further over to pray. Stay here and keep watch. A verse in scripture later on, we hear watch and pray. Again, instructions for believers. Watch and pray. And this is what Jesus asked the three to do. They had been privileged to be with him in some of the most significant events in his ministry. Healing, transfiguration, raising from 
the dead. Stay here and keep watch. We've got to this place, a familiar place, and Jesus was doing something that he regularly did, and that was pray. But the next thing I want you to think with me in this passage is the pain. And we read in verse 35 following, going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that it be possible the hour might pass from him. Jesus being fully aware of what is coming next in the plan of God. He felt the pressure of it. And prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Basically, he's saying, Father, is there any other way of doing this? He knew that he'd been sent into the world to save the world from their sins. He knew that he had come to release sinners from the the grasp of Satan and his power over their lives, which had been seen in his miracle of releasing the, the demonic man in bondage, in chains, and the chains even couldn't hold him. He wanted to release the people from that. And we are all in bondage. From the moment we are born, we are in bondage to sin. And Jesus knew he had come to release people from that bondage. But he says to his father, is there any other way that this can be done? Because we read the word Abba, Father. Or in our terms, Daddy. Daddy, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but you, but what you will. Here we have Jesus being under pressure. The three disciples had been with him on the Mount of Transfiguration and they had seen him in all his glory. They had seen basically his divinity because he was transfigured before them. He was changed. It's almost as if they were looking through the human form and they could see the divine. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, we see the divinity of of the Lord Jesus. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see the humanity of Jesus. He was fully human. And he knew exactly what this was going to entail. Take this cup from me. But you see, it's not just the physical that he's going to experience. In those days, crucifixion was the worst form of execution you could think of. And before they even got to the cross, as we will discover in the next few weeks, we will discover that Jesus was not only accused, condemned, but he was then flogged to within an inch of death. Many, many prisoners never even got to the cross because they died because of the flogging. Think of the crown of thorns. Have you ever got a a thorn in your finger? You know how painful it is and it can linger for a long time. But think what it would be for those thorns, big thorns, something like black thorn, been pressed down into your brow. How painful that would be. But Jesus is not just thinking about the physical. Jesus is thinking about the spiritual. Remember, Jesus Christ was sinless. He never committed a sin. We were having problems this morning with the children trying to recognize that they'd done anything wrong. But Jesus never did anything wrong. He was perfect in every way. And for him to take on himself the sin of the world, for the very first time in his life, he was going to experience being sinful in that sense. 
The sin of the world was on him. And he was going to have to bear the punishment for that sin. And sin separates us from God. And as we discover in Jesus on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, he was experiencing the wrath of God. Not for anything he had done, but for us. But look at the submission of Jesus. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Not my will, but thine be done in the, in the AV. Jesus, knowing that he had come to save the world from, this, from their sins and knew that a sacrifice had to be made. And so he says, Father, this is going to be horrible. This is going to be horrendous, not only physically, but spiritually. But I will do it. We have the pain that Jesus suffered in the garden. But there was another pain, a human pain. Because then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch for one hour? Why do you think he singled out Simon Peter? Because the other two were asleep. And probably the other disciples are falling asleep because they had a long day. They had just celebrated the Passover. And that would have been quite a meal. So I know on a Sunday after I have my dinner, I can very easily fall asleep. But here they were sleeping. But he, he calls out Simon Peter because just a short time before, as we discovered last week, Peter says, I'll never desert you. I, I, I'll be there with you the whole time. And Jesus had asked them to keep watch. And they didn't. The pain of failure on the side of the disciples. And that's why he says to them, watch and pray and he gives them a reason why they should do it so that you will not fall into temptation Peter said I I'll never deny you I'll never walk away from you I'll be there alongside you no matter what I'll even die with you and Jesus says watch and pray so that you'll not fall into the temptation of giving up the temptation of failing the master because he reminds them, you are human. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes, you may want to, in your mind, be there for me. You want to be alongside me and, and be a strength and a stay. But he said, you are weak, you are human. You will be tempted to give up. So you need to watch and pray. And Jesus gave that example of what they were like. He speaks to us as well. Because as believers, we may, in our minds, we want to be strong for Jesus. We want to do the right thing. We want to be upright. But we want to be strong and not fail. But we're likely to. But knowing that and being warned by Jesus, surely we should watch and pray. Watch out for those things that are going to tempt us away from the Lord. And then pray for the strength not to give in. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It goes on to say once more he went away and prayed the same thing. He went back and he prayed that this cup would pass. If you turn to John's gospel, you'll find other things that Jesus had, had prayed. But when they come back again, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And he probably said, 
Still asleep? <laughs> Didn't know what to say to him. They had no excuse. Yes, their eyes were heavy, but they needed to watch and pray. Returning the third time, he said to him, are you still sleeping and resting? Here we have the pain of being failed. And I'm sure some of us have experienced that. Someone in whom we had put faith and trust, a friend, a parent, a boss, and they failed us. And we know the hurt, the pain that that can cause. Well, Jesus experienced that he was fully human. And so he experienced the pain of them not being able to stand with him. And so he says, enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Again, here with the pain of Jesus knowing that someone who had been with him for three and a half years is going to betray him. Betrayal is a horrible thing. It's a painful thing, and Jesus experienced that pain. And then we are told, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from whom? Chief priests, the religious leaders, the teachers of the law and the elders, those who have been talking about the Messiah coming and how wonderful it's going to be. And here they're coming with clubs and swords wanting to get rid of him. The place, Gethsemane, the pain that Jesus underwent. And then the final P is the plan. What was the plan? Well, Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The betrayer's kiss. On one hand, he's saying, teacher, the one that I have been listening to, the one I've been following, the one I have seen do all these marvelous things, the one who claimed to be son of man and son of God, Rabbi, and then he kissed him. Sealed with a kiss. What was sealed? Doom was sealed that day. Then, of course, we always have someone in the crowd who wants to be the hero. Or was it fear? It's hard to work out. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. In John's gospel, we are told that this high priest servant was called Malchus. And Dr. Luke, in his gospel, says that Jesus healed the man. Mark just tells us that Peter, because that's who John tells us did the deed. Impulsive Peter, being a hero, afraid, didn't know what to do, lunches out. And cuts the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. That's not what Jesus wanted. And yet, he comes with very, very strong condemnation in many ways. He says, am I leading a rebellion? Said Jesus. That you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me. And then, with a bit of irony, he says, every day I was with you. I was teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me there. Isn't that interesting? 
Why did they not? Well, you, you, if you're being very spiritual, you say, well, it wasn't Jesus' hour. It wasn't the right time. But for them, they were afraid. They were afraid of Jesus. Because the crowds loved him. They welcomed him into Jerusalem as he went riding on a donkey. And they proclaimed him to be the son of David. <coughs> Hosanna. Which means praise. Praise. They didn't even attempt to arrest him. But Jesus said, you did not arrest me there, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. He knew the scriptures. He knew why he had come and that he had come to be the sacrifice. The scriptures told in the Old Testament how Jesus would have to be taken, condemned, and die. The plan, but here's something that the disciples didn't think of in the plan. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Oh yes, even Peter. Peter who said, I am be with you. And, and don't forget all the other disciples agreed with him. They said, well, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll, we'll not deny you. We'll, we'll be with you. And yet everyone deserted him. I wonder when we are under pressure, whenever unbelievers are getting at us, making fun of us, wanting us to do things that we know are wrong. Are we tempted to give in? And have we given in? I know I have. To my shame. Everyone deserted him and fled. And then a very interesting verse at the end. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Mark includes this interesting verse. And there have been lots of discussion <coughs> and suggestions of who this person was. And one of the ones that makes sense, a lot of sense, is that this was John Mark, the author of the gospel. Because remember, Peter was the source of this gospel. Mark had known Peter and Peter had basically told him the story and Mark recorded it for us. But why is this here? I would say Mark includes this in it because he's saying everyone deserted Jesus, even me. Even me. And I trust that we have the honesty to say, I have failed the Lord Jesus. Yes, even me. The one who thinks that I can live my Christian life in my own strength, that, that I'll never do anything wrong. I'll never deny Jesus by my words or my life. Mark, if this is true, says everyone deserted Jesus. Everybody failed Jesus that night, even me. But the gospel also tells us that even as failures, there's recourse. That we can come back and we can be forgiven. Because that is the nature of God. The nature of God tells us that his love and his mercy is available to those who come before him. In humility and confession. Not coming high-handed and saying, well, you know, it's, it's, it's just a wee blip. No, no, we say, I have failed. Lord, restore. All you have to do is read through the book of Psalms and you'll see how David deals with his failures. An example to us. But this narrative that leads us up to the cross reminds us 
of Jesus, who was a man of prayer, who encourages us to be people of prayer. He was fully human. He experienced the pressure. He came to his heavenly father honestly and saying, look, I don't like what's coming up ahead. If it's possible, let it pass. But if not, I am willing. I am willing. Are we willing to face whatever is coming up ahead of us? We may not like it. At the moment, it's maybe unknown to us. But can we say with the Lord Jesus, not my will, but yours be done, O Father. And knowing what happened to the disciples, how they deserted the Lord, let's take what Jesus said to them, watch and pray. So it will not fail the Lord. But even if we do, his forgiveness is there. Let's pray. Father God, we we recognize that Gethsemane was a special place to the Lord Jesus. But in this part of the story, we realize how he struggled humanly and how he recognized that the task for him ahead was going to be so, so difficult. Lord, may we thank you, Jesus, for saying, not my will, but yours be done, because in your submission to the will of God we can be saved we can become children of God through faith help us to hear his instruction to watch and pray not just today but every day so that we will be the people that you want us to be for your glory we ask these things amen we take up the story of Gethsemane in our final hymn which is the servant king Uh, And it talks about the garden of tears where Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Let's stand to sing.
this place being willing to say, not your will, but thine be done. Let us bless one another as we come and say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.